<laughs> um, okay, uh, so hi everybody. Uh, we're, we're doing our panel on sourcing biography uh, with me. Uh, I'm Robin Enrico. Uh, with me, all the way on the left is, uh, to my left, is Typex. Uh, in the middle is Beth Barnett. And right next to me is Peter Hui. Uh, just so you know a little bit about our panelists, uh, Typex will be talking about his book, Andy, A Factual Fairy Tale, The Life and Times of Andy Warhol. Uh, Typex is coming to us from Amsterdam. And his book covers kind of from birth to death the life of uh, Andy Warhol. Uh, Beth is coming to us from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her book, Dreamers of the Day, is concerned with the life of T.E. Lawrence, or more popularly known as Lawrence of Arabia, and her studies into his life. And lastly, uh, Peter, not with his collaborator, Maria, um, he, pr he produces uh, coin-op comics, which are you know nonfiction co biographical comics covering a variety of subjects as opposed to just one like our previous two panelists. Um, so there. Uh, oh, and I should have advanced the slides. That would, there's type. <laughs> I was doing it on my computer. There's Typex's book, which is amazing. There's Best book, which is great. And that'll give you a sense of coin-op comics that Peter does. Yeah, there we are. Um, OK, so I thought about your work, all y'all's work a lot. But um, one of the first questions I wanted to ask was, so where do you decide to focus your attention when scripting out the narratives for your biographies? Like, what are your intentions, like both for you as an artist and, and for what you want the audience to feel about the moments you include. Now, you'll see in, in some cases, for, for Peter here, uh, for, you know, his, his, the, the work in Coinop focuses a lot on some lesser known subjects. This is, this is a sort of biography of the filmmaker Val Luton, who, if you're a film buff, you know, but otherwise, this is somebody who stopped making films by the early 1950s. Um, with, with Beth, you can see a little bit of what her book looks like here. You know, there's a very, and I think these pages even show it, there's a very conscious effort to not talk about the overly discussed portion of T.E. Lawrence's life, you know, the, the one that has been turned into the famous movie. And if we look a little bit at Typex's work, uh, if you read the book, um, he, his, his portrayal of Warhol you know, the art stuff is kind of minimized or, or made lesser than, in the narrative, the real personal stuff of, of Warhol's life. This is a Andy's interactions, you know, living with his mother, or I'll show you another slide in a second, if it works. This is, this is Andy on tour with the Velvet Underground, but it's a lot of backstage stuff and a lot of, you know, interpersonal stuff. I, I really like the panel on the left of him driving in the car with Nico. So, Returning to the original question, you know, how do you pick out the mo the, the stuff you want to show? <laughs> like, well, for me, um, doing the research into the subjects, uh, the subjects are chosen as people who appeal to me by what they did artistically, whether it's music or film, generally in those two areas. Uh, it's in doing the research and, and the sort of deep dive into their work that I kind of discover or rediscover in some cases aspects of them and their career that, that interest me. And that's the kind of points that I'm drawn to in telling their stories. Um, and for me, with my work, um, I really wanted to show people why I'm interested in T. Lawrence. Um, obviously, most people have seen or know of Lawrence of Arabia, but he was a really interesting person outside of that. And I wanted to make sure that I could show people what really interested me about him, and it's his being a polymath and so much other interesting things. So, um, I wanted to show the things. Um, I, I don't want to repeat things that Andy already did because I think all his paintings are well free for everyone to see, and um, you see them everywhere. So I delved more into his character and to make a book about someone, you have to recreate that character and make it uh, your own character. So it's, it's about the comic art. Uh, the, the title, the full title is Typex's Andy, because it's not the real Andy, of course. It's, it's a 
cartoon that I made about Andy Warhol. It's like uh, Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse is not a real mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that 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 that, that uh, kind of following up with that, it um, is it or is it does it really come from that attraction to the the subject matter like when do you when you start out you is it these are subjects you you're obviously very interested in like these are people who are very influential to you and when you when you kind of make the biography is it is it does it come from a place of you know this person is is so huge to me i i want to share it with you like i just want to share my my affection and energy for this person with you or does it, do you, in your own work, do you feel it comes from more of like, hey, I, I really need to educate you about this person. Like, I know them and I love them, but maybe other people don't. And I, I just need to get that information out. Uh, for me, it comes from uh, my own fascination. Uh, I, I tend to focus on uh, individuals that, that have a great deal of resonance for me. And, uh, and sometimes it works out and it can develop into a full on biography that, that gets to completion and other times it doesn't. You know, I can start researching and really looking into someone and realize that you know, maybe it's not gonna work out. Um, but I, I tend to let my own interest you know, drive the project. Um, and for me it's a bit of a combination of both. Um, I'm very, very focused on things that interest me and um, years ago I picked up a biography of Lawrence and thought it was awesome because he was just weird and funny and um, just like a really interesting and educated person. And as I've gotten older and I've been doing more research into him, realizing that I can educate people about what's going on in the modern world through telling his story has been really beneficial and um, highly enjoy doing that, so. Um, my first aim is always to have um, an interesting story. So there are other people who have been uh, probably had more influence on me, or um, or uh, I'm a big fan of uh, several uh, artists. But um, that wouldn't make a good book, essentially. And I think uh, Andy is sort of a key figure in um, very crucial of his time, and his time is from the 30s till the 80s. And that's uh, essentially where everything I love in this world uh, stems from. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think about um, what Beth said about reading, having all, like, that's all, some of the, all these people, you know, in some form or another have, kind of have stuff written about them, right? They are, they do exist within the popular culture. And, and, and I've mentioned a lot of you are trying to you know, pick out stuff about them that it's like, yeah, but like, let's focus on this. Let's look at this part of their lives or, or this influence they had. Um, the thing I was thinking, one of the things I was thinking about though was like, you know, when, when you deal with these, these figures, these famous figures in our lives, we, we kind of have a sense of them from, you know, being into the work they do or having seen the work they do. And, and this is a kind of process oriented question with biography stuff. So when you set out, you go, okay, I'm gonna do a piece about this person. I'm, now I have to do more research into them. Did you, did you find in researching these people, like giving them the serious look over, that there were things you, you were like surprised to find out or that they, it changed your opinion of them? And in, if, if it changed them, did it change the way you wanted to make art about them? <laughs> there's always surprises in doing the research, uh, and there's always a way that the research not only shapes the way you see them, but sort of unshapes the way you see them. I find, uh, just for myself in researching people, that you often find a lot of sort of the traditional view of, pers of a person or the sort of popular view of a person is not the actual way the person was, and that, t to me, is always surprising and enchanting. It's something I really look for, and I you know, take a great deal of joy when I that's like the, the little nugget that you're looking for. And I have a similar view. Um, obviously, like with this figure, he's known for two years of his life. And yeah, 
and but it, the interesting thing is is that this is not what he intended to do and when the war ended he pretty much went to hiding um and i find it really interesting like you'd think that this person who's been like awarded like named as a hero across many co countries like would turn down honors from the king because he didn't think he deserved them and like just decided to spend the rest of his life like in the service as a, like essentially doing grunt work um, which is really interesting and that's what I want to share with people is like this is two years that defined who this person is but there was a lot that happened after. And I wonder if you agree with me, but you're always looking for a sort of reflection to your own life. So oh, yeah. in a way, we're doing autobiographies about other people. I don't think you can avoid that. Yeah, no, it's, no. it's the only, you know, the only resource you have in understanding someone is, of course, um, your own experience. Your own experience. Yeah, yeah. That's where you... I felt like doing, when doing this book, I kind of felt like Werner Herzog. <laughs> yeah. Just like, yeah, and you, you make up all, all the dialogue, of course. Yeah. You don't take any written dialogue because that's all fake. That's all yeah. somebody True. else's viewpoint. So, yeah, yeah. three more autobiographies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And you often discover how many you know, sort of popular quotes, allegedly, from subjects you're uh, investigating are not, they never actually said. No, you know, no, they, that's... press releases that yeah. they put yeah. out or they're, they're contractions that previous biographers made to sort of complete their version of the idea of what that person was like. Mm -hmm. And boy, you, you fall over that and it's just a light bulb goes on. Yeah, so yeah and, and actually we're honest by, you know, adding our name to, uh, <laughs> to our biography. But all the things we take for actual facts are all oh, yeah. so uh, subjective. Completely. And, and mm -hmm. what, what bothered me was that from all the biographies I read about Andy, was that I, I couldn't possibly like the guy at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, well, if, I, I spent five years working on this book, so you're well, not going to be five years with somebody you don't like. Yeah. I mean, he's had a tremendous amount of things written about him from yes. every possible yes. perspective, including his own diaries, which yeah. were just a certain view of him. And, you know, and that's Patty. actually mm -hmm. the, the diaries that made me. Um, for the first time, I had a feeling I understood something, at least that I could create something. Mm -hmm. And those diaries, I don't recommend to anyone because they're <laughs> 700 oh. pages of gossip and whining, but <laughs> I, I, I love them. I really I loved it. Do, yes, do. you read them, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, now I need to read them. <laughs> yes. Well, we didn't recommend it, though. <laughs> it's okay. I like reading diaries yeah. and private letters. And yeah. yeah. So, okay. So I want to I wanna go into a... Um, one of the interesting kind of, you know, I, I try to be comparative when dealing with multiple works and, and draw a line between them. And one of the interesting things I noticed about all three of your works was this idea of it's thinking about how we present biography. And I, I thought back to like, Oh, you know, when you when you read a biography or or watched a biography when I was younger in like the 80s or 90s, they were very staid and they were from a very like omniscient centralized voice. And all of you kind of start to all of you kind of break away from that and use like a multitude of voices to try to get to the heart of who the, who the, who the subject is. Um, you can see the slide from, from Peter's work. Uh, this is about filmmaker Nicholas Ray. And you have quotes from Francois Truffaut and Jim Jarmusch, and even quotes from, from Ray himself. And they're all intermingling to try to get at this picture of the man. And this is... And this is one of, the, and if I can advance it, there we go. This is one of one of the amazing things. Um, if you haven't read Typex's book, there's a whole chapter in the book that kind of views Andy from Edie Sedgwick's point of view. And then later in the book, there's a chapter that kind of deals with Andy from Valerie Solanus's point of view. And it's like these are very interesting vectors to try and approach these these figures. And oh, technology, um, you know, best 
with Beth's book, it's it's inherent because it's it is very much her viewpoint on T. E. Lawrence. You know, a man who died long before she was born and lived in another country and lived this very different life, but intermingling her study of him and her going to Oxford, you know, to um, well, her going to uh, her, her going to you know see to England to see all his his private materials and deal with the research that's been based around him and and that experience being part of the story. So so how do you guys? What kind of what kind of put you in the position where like you are where you decided no I I, I want to do this more hybridized style instead of like. Or, or just to break away from, you know, the, the very classical sense of how a biographical information is delivered. Speaking for myself, I would say that the medium of comics is one of the things that really helps that. Um, the, the, the way that comics are a mix of drawing and, uh, and text, uh, words and pictures, is a, it, to me a natural way of breaking down a story into a multiplicity of parts uh, in order to create a whole in a way that sometimes just a straight up like written biography or like a, a biography that you might see on TV or something tends to just the medium itself kind of forces it into kind of a linear way. But um, I don't know about you guys, but for me, doing it in panels and, and with words and stuff and then being able to split up those panels into pieces to move forward and backward in time is just, it seemed very natural to approach it that way. Yes, it could only be done in comics, what mm -hmm. we do. Yeah. I yeah, think I it's think a, right. a unique yeah. uh, medium. Totally. And you can change your style and, and, and you can Ships pace the time. And, yeah. 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 Absolutely. I mean, mine came across, it came, came to be um, largely due to an accident. Um, I had sat down intending to do a 20 page, like, this is a trip that I made, this is so cool, sort of thing. And then I realized I had to provide context. And I had to explain who this person was. And relating who Lawrence is to me, and it's like was going to have a very personal viewpoint to it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Happy accidents. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's but that's in, that's interesting because it's like you start from the position that I didn't see I, that I, that didn't come through in the book, but or I missed it, but that is like a very revealing thing that, that the piece started out as almost a travelogue kind of, right? Yeah, that's, that's what it was in. I just was like, oh, I'm going to do this short project because in my, in my book, I mentioned that two weeks before I made this trip, I quit my job to do comics full time. And um, I was sort of, when I got back, deciding what it was that I wanted to actually be doing. And I said, oh, I'll just do a short thing about this trip while I write up and start like going through all of my research that I did and really really hone in on doing this like serious biography, um, which I'm still planning on doing. Um, hmm. But in doing that, I realized like, oh, like I can tell a bit of the story through telling my story and then hopefully get people interested in reading the more of the story that's less filtered through my eyes, but will still be filtered through my eyes because that's, I'm the person who's writing it. So it was very organic, like yeah. growing yeah. under your fingers. Wow. Um, yep, and the stack of index cards that went from 20 pages to 160 index cards, <laughs> and <laughs> then as I was drawing it, cutting it down again, and and you had to rearrange everything when yep. you were yeah yeah of rearrange things and um, gave it to my husband and be like read this and tell me what it's missing and. Mm. Uh, yeah. I always ended up realizing that I wanted to add more background information and wanted to give more context to the story and realizing the different angles of context that I needed to include was really interesting because it also became a what was I thinking at a specific moment and yeah. So do you guys find that as you do these biographies that the story tends to get bigger rather than smaller? It gets yes. like wider rather than more narrow. Uh, my mine is that. mine mm -hmm. is five hundred and sixty-two pages, yeah. and it was so hard to cut it down yeah. to that. <laughs> I mean, it could easily be. It was easier to make it a thousand mm -hmm. than. Yeah. 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 For for my eventual project, um, I'm actually thinking of it in terms of a trilogy. Mm -hmm. So as I have the portion before the war, during the war, and then after the war, and that way I can limit things to per per specific time periods and build on from there. Um, who knows if that's actually how it's going to 
be finished, but it's helping me be able to conceptualize what I will discuss. Yeah, I also found that it's very useful to have chapters. Yes. Because you have one person's life, and as we all know, that's uh, one big chaotic mess. Mm -hmm. So that's you have to one. find. The way to yeah. Is a chaotic mess. You have to make it readable, yeah. you know, yeah. enjoyable. Make life enjoyable. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Yeah, you establish <laughs> yeah. these demarcations. We're gonna yeah. Chapters. So yeah. you have to put some order into all this, and uh, you have to pull something from the end and mm -hmm. stuff it in the beginning, and then. Yep. Yeah. But open within those chapters, it's still crazy. Yeah. 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 Then you start all over again. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's. Yeah. It's kind of. It's interesting. Kind of the, the again the the process stuff is what really fascinated me about about these works and I'm gonna jump ahead a teeny bit out of order but um, and when you're talking about uh, the fact that it's not just that it's biography it's it's comics biography right yeah, and yeah. it's not you know that it's not um, it's not the the prose biography it's not the you know, PBS special biography, slow pan over mm -hmm. photographs of the subject, uh, talking heads version of it. And one of the things I saw all of you doing was being really creative with the way you presented information. And it's not just like, it wasn't even just like, here's a panel, here's a panel, here's a panel. This happens, then this happens, then this happens. There was even further hybridization within the work. Um, you look at the slide that's up from Beth's book. Uh, she's taking photographs that I, I believe Lawrence took mm -hmm. and then re-rendering them in her own style. But it's like it's mixing multiple medias there. And then also incorporating, you know, you were given, I believe, like a collection of all the pop culture that stuff that spawned out of. Yeah, it was um, part of the exhibit that I had attended. Okay, um, yeah. And, and it's like. I wasn't allowed to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> it was behind glass. Right, but you can you can see in the slide like here's this recreation of this Mad Magazine cover. So it's an it's it's a it's an illustration of an illustration, mm -hmm. you know, of a on a physical object. So you were showing sort of the echoes of him in, yeah. within the pop culture. Yep. And as it spread out. Yeah. It was that was a really weird part of the exhibit. There was a board game. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. It, you have to blow up trains. So that is the point of the game. <laughs> <laughs> right. And and this is this is from Peter's work. Um, dealing with the, the biography of Orson Welles, uh, this, this hyper-stylized, multiple tracks of information running at once, and underneath it, this kind of meta-commentary um, in the form uh, of a film. You know, even I was like, this is, this is a lot to process, but like, this is kind of avant-garde way to deal with. Well, it's very much like Orson Welles. I was, in a way, trying to mimic Orson Welles' approach to, to filmmaking and the, the strip that runs along the bottom is like the, the fake documentary March of Time that runs through Citizen Kane, which in and of itself was an avant-garde act by Wells' film, which was so groundbreaking, which was that he did a fake documentary about a subject who was a fake subject, <laughs> who he was satirizing a real guy, William Randolph Hearst, in a film. And I just thought that was great, which is why my comic has not one Orson Welles, but four. Right. Uh, different Orson Welles characters from different films all interacting with each other, some getting along, some not. And one more slide here, if it comes up. Oh, no. Um, so, and, and again, if you read Ty Pix's book, he changes styles multiple times throughout. And one of the cool things is like the, the comic style very much reflects the time period in Andy's life that it's representing. But even within that, there are stylistic changes you can and, and aesthetic changes, sometimes even one-offs. You see on uh, the right almost a Sunday cartoon strip version of Andy talking with his you know sort of secretary and like best friend Bridget Berlin. And on the left, you have this, you know, you have this kind of like back of a comic book ad about being, are you ready for love? Discussing, you know, the strange relationship between Edie Sedgwick and Andy Warhol. And I think the, the overall question I got to was it's not just, it's not just, oh, okay, comics lend themselves to 
interesting ways to, you know, a new way to think about doing biographies. What el like are the, what other elements do you feel can be brought in to to make this this form new? You know, what other are there other stylistic techniques you thought about when you were making these works to be like this is actually, you know, this is the more interesting way to sell this information or get this information across to the audience. For me, I think the, the subject um, guides the, the way, the stylistic way of doing it. I kind of, you know, with like the Orson Welles thing that you brought up, that I, I kind of let Orson Welles' films, especially Citizen Kane, which showed very much his, his own sly sense of humor uh, and, and uh, self-deprecation and self-aggrandizement at the same time towards the act of filmmaking. I let that kind of uh, thing guide my approach to the visual way that I told the story. You know, to me, it was important that the uh, that helped bring him across more through the through the comic form. Yeah, um, and I tried to use Lawrence's letters as much as possible yeah. um, to really bring about points. Um, so it's one thing to like discuss someone's sexuality and not quote, which is, I find really strange. Um, so a, a lot of his letters are either very thinly veiled or very explicit um, about his confusion with sex and because um, he was likely asexual. Um, and being able to bring in these snippets of letters and be able to incorporate them with the pictures is really cool. Well, as Peter said, uh, to, uh, we're all guided probably by mm -hmm. our subjects, and mm -hmm. I don't know if, like, I think all comic artists either teach or do illustrations on the side. Mm -hmm. You sure. probably I do agree. illustrations, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I figured. Well, I work uh, a lot as an illustrator in Holland. I also work for a, a pop ma magazine, and if they ask me one week to do Nick Cave and the other week to do Lady Gaga, I can't imagine to do that in the same style. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So yeah. that is that would be ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, for me, the, the changes of style come uh, very natural. As mm -hmm. nat because my uh, at first did a sketched version of this book, but I had to show it to the Warhol Foundation, uh, or things wouldn't happen at all. <laughs> and um, that I did in one style, and then I saw this is such a long story. It, it, uh, at first, I didn't want to change style because I thought that's too de demanding of the reader. Mm -hmm. But um, it was really far more demanding to have one style throughout a, a 500 plus page book. Plus, yeah. so it would be boring. It would be yeah. boring, yeah. yeah. Well, Andy would have loved it to be boring, of course. <laughs> 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 oh, it's so boring. Yeah. Wonderful. This is yeah. a guy who had a film of the Empire State Building yeah. for eight hours just, yeah. just being there. Yeah. yeah. There's, yeah. There's another. There's another stylistic thing that I noticed. All of you doing, if we zoom back a little bit, um, and and it also leads into this thought about how do we process all this information. So, you know, Typex in dealing with with Warhol and dealing a lot with his personal life um, deals with this tremendous cast of characters um, and and has to and and, and, that, and there has to be a narrative way to be like okay can I how do I get these across who these people are to the audience quickly and in, and in a very amazing uh, narrative conceit every sort of chapter begins with as you'll see these trading cards like and with the picture of the character on the front and then on the back here is like the brief autobiographical synopsis so that when they appear in the narrative, you know, it's not like, wait, who is that? Like, what is their, their role here? And Beth, you do a lot of this same thing where it's, okay, I just have one image of a person, mm -hmm. right? And you do it, especially when you're talking a lot about the politics surrounding Lawrence, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I. Here's the person. I'll, I'll just show you a picture of them, and then, kind of a big block of text, to explain who they are. And we even have a version of Peter doing that with, with a series you did on musicians, right? Where you have these like lush, like incredible single drawing, and then and then instead of using panels, you are like, okay, let me do this graphic design text, and. I would have thought like, 
oh boy, this is this is this is telling, not showing, and yet they all work. Mm -hmm. And and so my question is not only a was this okay? Am I are you doing this as a form of expediency as a way? It's like I just need to compress this information down, but what is the thought process, especially on that single image? Well, for me, uh, for the music ones, it was a, a kind of mimicry of uh, liner notes that appear on the back of LPs. I'm a total music freak. We all are. Yeah. We needn't yeah, ask. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I personally love reading liner notes on yeah. albums. Mm -hmm. just, it mm -hmm. just fascinates me. And often they break the type up into little bits. There'll be stuff that someone writes about it, and then there'll be little technical notes, and then there'll be a song list, and there'll be a list of the, the credits, like a, who was the engineer, and all that stuff. And do, it's do you up. first read the album before you play it? Usually listen to it and read it at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Have and just, full enjoyment. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> just overwhelm the senses mm -hmm. that way. So to me, I was just in my own way trying to recreate that sensibility that I have, a sense of enjoyment of, of reading liner notes that just give all this technical information, like who played flute on that song? Mm -hmm. yeah. Who was the recording engineer? And then the, the long discursive main body of text that some critic writes saying this is the best damn record in the world and you find out later it's the A and R guy. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But still you, you like it. You know? Yeah. Um, so expediency was largely my choice for this. Um, I wanted to make sure that I could get information about side characters being in the case that uh, what Robin showed um, these two um, political figures Mark Sykes and Francois Georges Picot um, who made an agreement called the sykes picot Agreement, which is horrible. Um, <laughs> and that's putting it lightly. Um, because I have a tendency to ramble, even when I'm making books, as can be seen from it going from 20 pages to 140. Um, so I was like, OK, I need to do this briefly and get as much information in as possible. Um, and the image combined with text um, show what I, was, what I liked was being able to show a little bit of their character as well without just being like text, text, but yeah. There's also another factor I think is, is uh, what, what you always want to do when you're doing a comic is slow the reader down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Because important. the reader is ten, tends to read the text and forget the images. Yeah. Yeah. So if you put one big image, so that can't be evaded. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you slow them down more by, by putting all these texts around mm -hmm. it. Comics is the art of delay. Yes. yes. You want to yes. slow people down to, yeah. to savor the, mm -hmm. the, the, the flow yeah. of the story. My flow always is to go slow, not to go fast. Yeah. And why we need so much page, pages, because if you want to, <laughs> to slow them down, you know, if you want to see somebody is bored stiff by just sitting in a waiting room, then you have to, you can't, you know, you can't Every just band. have one image of him because mm -hmm. right. nobody believes you. Yeah. yeah. And I hate the, the overtexts. You know, the yeah. voice over oh, yeah. suddenly and ooh. I try to era. avoid that as much yeah. as possible. Yeah. Later at night, no, show a moon or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's it, it's 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 weird because you know, it, well, the thing I was thinking about, I was like, oh, these are like these are like a por it's like a singular portrait and, mm -hmm. a, and a caption, and and even in the context of of what we we're talking about before, it's like it becomes this this mixed media thing like it becomes not just not just comics not just not just representations of, of letters or, or you know or stylistic choices mm -hmm. it's like okay this is portraiture as well like and and how much it, it's crazy like w you've done these long biographies but sometimes even just a single image of a person mm -hmm. and just a little bit about them we we can construct so much about the person from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. that's right. Yeah, agreed. Um, the, 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 the last thing I was going to ask, and then we can probably do questions quickly, is, you know, I just want to double check my notes. Um, in, in, in thinking about that issue of like, OK, I, I only need a little bit of, of just a, like a picture and a description can nail somebody. When you are there is the selection process. What kind of, of facts you want to include? What kind of stuff do you when you when you encounter it in your research? Do you go, 
yeah, I don't, I don't need this. Like, is it just personal preference, or is there, or is there a cutting out of like, you know, the audience doesn't need this. I don't know. For me, it seems to be personal preference that drives it. My, it's my personal preference that sort of determines, you know, this is a, this is extraneous. This isn't really necessary. This isn't adding to it. It's just repetitive. Or in fact, maybe it's detracting. And mm -hmm. as far as like portraiture of an of an individual, like uh, I, I certainly use Google Image a lot and, and tracking down pictures of people. And it's always amazing. You can look at through hundreds of photographs of somebody who was very famous. And it's like, there he is, there he is, there he is sitting having dinner, there he is in a car. But then you'll hit one that's like, whoa, that's the one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's him right yeah. there. That's all his contradictions, the look on his face, the way he's slouching in his chair. That's mm -hmm. totally him. And, and you just feel like and, you And that's it. a yeah. personal thing. That yeah, was, totally that's personal. all about the reflection mm -hmm. you feel in your yeah, own uh, conception. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I always like to evade all the obvious. So. Yeah. Uh, the aha moment, the aha erlebnis, as the Germans say. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's terrible, you know, one moment he thinks of, um, I'm gonna do camel soup yeah. images. And mm -hmm. you know, the whole obvious thing, like everybody already heard this story a million times, and I didn't want to even show those paintings. Mm -hmm. Instead I showed a, a fake camel soup advertisement with Andy in it um, to oh, just in Esquire magazine where he's, he's popping out of the camps. I've, I've used it in a very small image. Yeah. It mm -hmm. was too good to... Um, yeah. And also, uh, uh, speaking of personal preference, if the moment that David Bowie comes to the studio and it's mm -hmm. total <laughs> uh, disaster <laughs> for both of them, yeah, you, you can't get around that one, of course. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and um, for myself, largely, it was determining, does it actually move the story forward the, the way that I'm trying to tell it? So there's stuff that I left out that, in future, I'd like to include, but it didn't tell the story. Uh, at one moment that I, because I was working so long on it, I knew he had met Donald Trump <laughs> once in his life. So, <laughs> yeah. So I thought, because I was working five years on it, in a very unlikely case that he's going to become president, I'll, I will <laughs> insert this bit, and I'm sorry, it's in the book, yes. Yeah, that, 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 that scene, when yeah. I got to it, I was like, oh, whoa, this is <laughs> really, yeah, that would have happened, but this is, has a whole new context now. Yeah. Um, so we, we only have a, about 10 minutes left. Um, I, I want to open up the floor to people other than me asking questions. Um, if, if people have questions, there are microphones in the aisle, so it'll be recorded correctly, and, and I'd like to hear what you want to say. Yeah, you can start over there. Uh, so this is kind of an offshoot of just this last question, um, and it definitely applies to more than just biographies, but uh, you all spoke about how, um, you know, as you do research, this, the project tends to get bigger and bigger, uh, and I was kind of wondering uh, how you know when to stop, and do you feel like, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're, how do you know when you've done justice to a whole person's life, I guess is my question. <laughs> I don't know how to stop. <laughs> As can be seen by the fact I had to buy a bookshelf because I had run out of space for all of my books. Um, but I'm selective of the materials that I'm choosing to use. Um, as much as I can, I'm trying to use the um, writings and archival material um, and trying to avoid as many biographies as possible because everyone has their own spin mm -hmm. and I know I'm going to be putting my spin on it but I'd like to put my own spin on what I've read from the original material. But didn't you have a feeling at a certain point that the story was, you know... Yeah, I mean for there, this... The, the, at one point you see the end coming Yeah, you try to evade it because you don't want to stop but... Yeah, for this book at least I was able to go like, oh, what did I actually look at in Oxford? And if it wasn't something that I looked at or thought about while I was there, I just did not bother digging any deeper. Um, but it was more so I didn't have to redo research that I've already done. <laughs> I gotta admit, I sometimes let the uh, deadline of the book going to press uh, <laughs> dictate, like, you know what, Pete, it, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> it's over. Well, I, I had a very, um, I had a structure of, of these, these magazines, are, or chapters, but they're built like magazines. So every chapter I had to build up to an end, or start from a start to an end. 
and that sort of helped me. That mm -hmm. sort of helped me a lot. And of course, um, I made it very easy for myself. I start with his, well, not his birth, but almost, and I end with his death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are very logical. Yeah, you know, yeah. Right? That's. Got it. Yeah. But there's Though I go a little bit beyond it, yeah. because yeah. I couldn't stop. I got a little bit beyond the death, but. <laughs> cool. Uh, we have a question over here. Yes, uh, firstly, just really beautiful work. I'm really impressed with everything that you guys have done. I'm really curious about this, this question that came up about um, varying uh, the visuals and, and the visual language when you know there's a time shift or it's someone else's perspective. So it's obviously you guys have all really have interest in creative solutions to do that, but is there any ever a concern that somehow it would break the narrative flow for readers, that somehow uh, you know, if it was one constant style, they would be drawn through, but somehow in flipping through, it can look cool, right? But somehow, it, maybe it breaks things up or, or, or not? I'm just no, I think that's, that's a total tension that we probably, all three of us, work yeah. with the whole time, is that you're always trying to balance, like, yeah. does it work or does it not work? And it, for me, that's just a constant thing that I'm thinking about from the very beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, you're always, in my case, at least, evaluating every single page or even within the page, the part of the page, like is this still working? Is it still adding up? Is it still moving forward at the pace I want it to? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's you guys that dictate our lives. And <laughs> <laughs> to get it through to the reader is a constant yeah. worry and uh, yeah. No, I've, in my book I used um, uh, visuals that come from Syrian tiles that I had seen at um, the Ashmolean Museum and I made a conscious effort to only include them in certain por portions of the book where I thought that they would really help make a point. Um, so. And I'll say, I'll say one other thing, and this, this has happened to me a bunch of times, is when you're working on something, you're looking at it intensely for long periods of time, and sometimes there's gaps there, there's breaks in the narrative that you don't see because in your mind's eye it's flowing mm -hmm. perfectly, yeah. but that's because you're making the jump because you know there's a gap there. And then I'll show it to like a friend of mine or my wife or somebody, and they'll read through and like, wait, page three to four, what's going on there? And like, yeah. oh, right, you know, all of a sudden it becomes very clear that you've, you've, you've got a hole that you've mm -hmm. got to fill. I, yeah. I give my scripts to my husband because he knows nothing about Lawrence and is therefore like the perfect person to be reading my scripts, so. Yeah. But even the next morning you can have this feeling, of yep. course. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. I'd like to f follow up on this and on Peter's comment about the, the you know holes in the narrative that you find, uh, and also Tpex's point that real life is hairy and messy and 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 so forth. And I know from you know working on you know biographical and historical material generally that there are there's the documentary record very rich in certain spots, and then these big gaps, these natural holes, you know, and how do you reconcile your work as a storyteller and this need to, you know, to entertain and satisfy and to get something in the can and to wrap it up in a narratively satisfying way? Yeah, th those holes are my favorite. I, and jump, I jump into those holes yeah. and wallow you're a, in You're it. a fiction writer. There, I mean, you know, you can, the, you know. all these happenings, those, those are the things that really are bothering. Those, those are bothers, you know, all these things happening, but those holes are wonderful, so, lovely. Yeah. So you have no, mis you have no problems about um, uh, this, the fuzziness between uh, biography and fiction in a certain sense, you know, in other words, being faithful to the historical record. When I hear Beth say, you know, she's in the archives and wants to, you know, be rooted in the fact of, of things, but we all know even from our own lives, the facts of our life are all kinds of dead ends that don't go any place mm -hmm. and people that drift in and out that look really interesting and then we never see them again and, you know, nothing, it's not like story. Life isn't like a story, no. but you're writing a story. So I'm just curious about how you each handle and your own feeling about, uh, about that, uh, you know, in treating the subject. I, I like the messiness and the yeah. contradiction yeah. of these people's lives, the, the contradictions that sometimes they were aware of and sometimes they weren't. And it just kind of, in a way, like we were talking, reflects our own lives. Mm -hmm. We have our own blind spots and, and things that we're completely unaware of that everyone else looks at us and it's 
perfectly obvious, <laughs> mm. and yet we don't see that. And to me, that's just like further proof of their being alive, mm -hmm. that they were a person. Yeah. Also, it's much easier to uh, structureize somebody else's life. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just lean into his being an unreliable narrator. Um, so. so you become one, too. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. But. but you also find that those facts that you're that you're always held up as these pillars of people's lives that upon close inspection reveal themselves to be uh, very rubbery. Oh, yeah. And yeah. they were written by maybe someone who had an axe to grind on that person. Yeah. <laughs> maybe who loved that person and didn't see things that were, you know, that were there. And yeah. So, oh. Yeah, and it's our job to sort of interpret that and, and take from it or not take from it what we want, but when we're doing that, we're we're creating our own version of it, which yeah. is as unreliable as anybody else's. It's always as fun to read mothers' perspectives on their on <laughs> yeah. their children. That's the funniest part, but they're even more unreliable. As you can see, my book is called A Factual Fairy Tale, so I make it clear on the cover. <laughs> All right. Well, well, cool. I think we're kind of almost out of time, but I, I want to thank uh, Typex, Beth, and Peter for giving this talk and for making amazing cool work that I got to read and think about real deep and thank all of you for coming out and chatting with us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.